Thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff, and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had an encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to listen to the show without commercial interruptions, please go to dogmanencountersradio.com and visit the How to Listen page to find out more about becoming a premium member. If you want to listen to the show free of charge but don't mind the commercials, the Dogman Encounters YouTube channel is what you're looking for. As always, thanks for listening. Before we bring on tonight's guest, I've got more narrated stories I wanted to read for you. The first encounter took place in Jackson County, Kansas. Before I say anything about my encounter, I just want to clarify that when I saw this thing, I went to Google and looked up what it was. I came across this website and found that another person in Jackson County had had an encounter with something like this, so I know I'm not crazy. I'd been studying wolves and their behavior for about three years before I had this encounter. Because of that, I know that Jackson County wouldn't be an unlikely place for a large predator such as a wolf to be lurking in the sparse woodland there. The county is about 656 square miles in area and has a population of 674,158. The county is also practically infested with wildlife such as deer, livestock, and predators like coyotes and foxes. The average wolf territory is 13 to 2,400 square miles, and it'd be easy for such a huge creature to live just in Jackson County alone. This may even be the very same dog-wolf-man thing the other eyewitness saw. Anyway, on to the encounter. I was just chilling on my laptop in the living room watching people blow stuff up when I felt like I had to go to the bathroom. I set the laptop down and put my headphones on the keyboard and got out of the chair. Let me clarify, I'm not a psychic or a medium or anything, but I've got sort of a sixth sense where I can tell if something is watching me, and I knew something was. We have a huge window on the wall just above the couch, and it was a particularly cold night, so the windows caught things like breath fairly well. I turned to the window thinking that whatever it was was watching me from there. I knew I'd see it if it was, because we have motion-sensing floodlights. It'd have to either be standing on something or tall as the devil himself in order to see in the window of her trailer. Its sill was around 6 to 8 feet off the ground, with the top of the window being about 11 feet off the ground. I looked over to the window, and the only thing I could see was that the floodlights were on, and that something seemed to duck under the window at that moment, like a kid who was playing hide-and-seek. I didn't think anything of it considering our neighbors were a bunch of druggies and alcoholics and often came to look in our windows. Every opening to the house was locked so I had nothing to worry about. So, I went to the bathroom and when I finished I washed my hands and went back to the laptop. I noticed that the floodlights had gone out so whatever it was was gone. Not thinking anything else of it, I went back to watching people blow stuff up. I should also mention that my eyes are sharp, sharp enough to spot a bird about 50 feet away in a tree, so it's no surprise that when the floodlights came back on, I noticed that immediately. When I did, I glanced up from the screen expecting to see a drunk or high idiot to be looking in with a stupid expression on his face, but I was frozen by what I saw. It was a huge, huge wolf that was looking in at me with dirty, ambery, yellow eyes. Its ears looked like they were torn or cropped or something, and the face looked sort of human-like. Not really a full human face, but the jawline looked very masculine and human compared to the rest of its face. Its lips were curled back, and it seemed as if it were snarling, though I couldn't hear it if it was. Its breath fogged the cold glass. It was so tall that the top of its head was halfway up the window, and if I had to guess how wide its head was, I'd probably say maybe the width of my shoulders. I knew that whatever it was, it most likely had wolfish instincts, so I did the only thing I knew to do, which was to avoid eye contact and make myself look as small as I could while having my throat and underside showing. This is a very common submissive position, and although I was scared out of my mind, I knew that holding eye contact would make me seem like a challenger to it, and running would make me seem like prey. When I did the submissive position, it must have worked because it just hit the window, which made the entire trailer shake, and then it went away. 
I haven't heard or seen anything else like it since, although I do hear the odd howl coming from the back roads from time to time. God help the poor idiot who decides to try and hunt this thing down. I can tell you now that whatever it was, it was not friendly, because if it was, it wouldn't have slammed my window as hard as it did, and it wouldn't have been growling at me like I had taken its food. Although it practically did assault my window, I could understand why it was upset. I was on its territory after all. I was an intruder and possibly a threat to its existence and its prey. It's really just best to stay out of its way and respect it. After all, it's one of God's many strange creatures in this world. Signed, Anonymous. Location, Jackson County, Kansas. Date, September 13th, 2013. I saw something Monday night that still has me totally shaken to my very core. I've always loved nature. I love the woods. I love hiking, camping, and fishing. I'm really into mycology, so I'm out looking for mushrooms and various types of fungus whenever I get a chance. The weather was absolutely beautiful on Monday for this time of year, so towards evening time I decided to round up some of my walleye gear and head down to an old train trestle which crosses the Mahoning River in Niles, Ohio. I had parked my car about a mile and a half from the trestle so I could walk the tracks and hit a few spots along the river on my way down there. By the time I reached the trestle, it was pretty much dark. I was wearing a headlamp at the time, so I had a dependable light source. At this location, there is a lake directly across the river and the two are connected by a small overhead dam. I was there for about 15 minutes when all of a sudden this overwhelming feeling of dread came over me. I switched my headlamp on and turned around to start back up the riverbank. When I did that, right behind a big sycamore tree, I saw what looked to be a very large animal kind of kneeling beside and behind it. As I locked my eyes on it, I completely froze. I knew I was definitely seeing something there, but my mind couldn't process what I was seeing. What I was looking at didn't make any sense. The thing I kept saying to myself was, animals aren't supposed to look like that. Right as I was thinking that, it was as if this thing read my mind. That's when it stood up and made itself perfectly visible to me in the most pretentious way. It almost had this vibe like, Yeah, now you see me and you know I'm real. I definitely exist. What are you going to do about it? Right after it did that, it kind of hunched over and made its way into the brush. I was out of there like a flash. As soon as my feet hit the tracks, I ran and ran the entire way back to my car without stopping. By the time I reached my car, I couldn't breathe. Both my legs were locked up, I was vomiting, and somewhere in between the encounter and running away, I had pissed myself. It's early Friday morning now, and I think I've only slept for about six or seven hours altogether. I've been constantly searching YouTube and all kinds of other sites, listening to eyewitness accounts, and it sounds like these things are encountered quite often. I've heard of the Dogman before, but never really took it seriously. Before the night of this encounter, I would always picture a dogman to look like some little skittish coyote-looking creature. Man, I love the woods and I love nature. The woods for me was always a safe haven I could venture into to escape stress. Stress at work, bills, relationship problems. I could always take a nice long hike, go fishing or foraging, and come home feeling 75% better. Now, I feel like I was threatened and kicked out of my second home. I keep thinking to myself, these things aren't supposed to exist. I feel like a terrified little kid who just came face to face with the dreaded monster in the closet. You know, the monster your parents told you, no wait, assured you wasn't real and couldn't hurt you. People need to be made aware of these things. They're as real as it gets and they're dangerous. Thinking back to what this thing looked like and how it was built, these things are perfectly adapted killing machines. The way its arms and legs looked, it looked like it was perfectly adapted to walk on all fours as well as on two legs. It was very quiet and fluent with its movements too. It's not like in the movies where the monster comes charging out of the woods, growling and snarling. These things are masters of camouflage and they utilize the darkness perfectly. I did notice a smell from it. That's probably because the wind was on my back at the time, but it sure smelled me. Its nose was up in the air the whole time of our encounter, just sniffing away. This experience has torn a huge hole in me. 
Every time I eat, I get nauseous. I can't sleep for more than 20 minutes at a time, and every time I close my eyes, that thing is all I can see. I'm trying not to dwell on the fear. I'm trying to accept what I saw and what had happened, but it's hard. I'm really glad to know I'm not alone. Signed, Anonymous. Location, Trumbull County, Ohio. Date, December 26, 2016. In April of 1979, I was a 22-year-old Sergeant E-5 stationed at Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune. I guess I should begin by saying I'm not sure what I saw except that it was approximately 7 feet tall and black in color with a snout and ears. Now my first reaction would be that we, there were two of us, saw an unusually large and tall black bear. However, We were 15 to 20 feet away and were looking up at this creature as it towered over us. I and the Lance Corporal who was part of my guard detail both stood over 6 feet tall. To make a long story short, a number of regiments, battalions, and companies were preparing for another round of exercises which would prepare us to fight the Warsaw Pact nations in Europe. It was typical Cold War training in the event the Soviet Union and its minions decided to cross the border and attack West Germany. I was attached to Communications Company Headquarters Battalion. My military occupational specialty was 2841, which was radio tech. In other words, I was a repairman. Basically, I worked on field radios for communications with other land units or aircraft. I also worked on cryptology equipment, which allows transmissions to be scrambled to avoid enemy interception of classified radio traffic and other types of communications. Because of this, I held a top-secret security clearance. I was due to be discharged in four months as my four-year enlistment was almost over and I wasn't re-enlisting. I'd been accepted to attend college at the University of Mississippi and was about done with military life. So, of course, my superiors were going to make my last few months difficult by giving me lousy details and duty assignments. I was put in charge of six other enlisted Marines, and we pulled guard duty for a week. Our assignment was to guard the various and sundry communications equipment vans and setups to be utilized at the command posts for the upcoming exercise. We would arrive at 5 p.m. and would be relieved at 7 a.m. when the setup personnel would arrive. I was the only one who was armed. My weapon was a Colt Model 1911A, 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol. I carried six rounds in the magazine, but nothing in the barrel. We were set up in a clearing in a heavily wooded area. There were plenty of large old growth trees there, primarily pines. I was pretty lax with my men as I wasn't a career marine and saw no need to be a strict disciplinarian. So basically, we all did a one-hour shift, starting at 10 p.m. and ending at 6 a.m. My only requirement was that the individual on duty stayed awake. Basically, we would cook hot dogs and marshmallows over the fire from the time we arrived until the actual watches started. We would sit around during this time and complain about the Marine Corps or tell stories about our girlfriends, wives, etc. Fairly normal activities. But the best part was the wildlife we encountered, which were primarily black bears. The bears would gather around within 6 to 10 feet of us while we were sitting around the campfire. We'd feed them hot dogs and marshmallows. This was every night and there would easily be a dozen bears sitting there, patiently waiting to eat. In retrospect, it was a bizarre sight. But then again, we were marines and I guess short of fear and common sense. On the last night we were on duty, I was walking around at 10 p.m. checking the various equipment areas, making sure everything was secure. I was with another Marine, and I had already posted the first guard of the evening who was sitting by the fire. I was carrying a clipboard, and the other Marine with me was carrying a flashlight. We were probably a 100 feet from the tent in which we slept and could see the tent and fire through the trees. As we were walking, I heard a low-volume snarl and told the other Marine to put the flashlight beam on a thicket slightly to our left. Well, what we saw was huge. It was every bit of seven feet tall and was broad. My first inclination was that it was a classic Sasquatch as depicted in drawings or photos, except it had a snout and ears. Anyway, we both yelled and ran into each other, dropping the clipboard and flashlight. 
I grabbed the other marine and turned around and yelled, Go, go, go! Meanwhile, as this is going on, I see the marine sitting by the fire jump up and grab the axe we used to cut firewood. He was obviously startled by our yell. I, of course, never drew my pistol. In fact, I never even thought about it. We told the other marines who by now were piling out of the tent that we ran into a large bear. However, I don't think it was a bear. I and the other marine thought it best to just say it was a bear and leave well enough alone. I've never seen a Bigfoot, cryptid creature, or ghost. I can't say I would bet my life that the creature we saw wasn't a bear, but I think that's highly unlikely. First off, I was in no way scared of the bears in the area, and second, the size of this thing was like something you'd see on display in a natural history museum. Well, that's my encounter. I don't know if it's of interest, but I figured I'd share it with you. Signed, Anonymous. Date, April of 1979. Time, 10 to 11 p.m. I live in the Cayman Islands, which is located in the Caribbean. I'm an accountant and my wife of nine years who travels with me is a successful lawyer. Coming from the Caribbean, we have no carnivores or forests on our island, so I have no knowledge of large animals in the wild, nor do I ever intend to seek them out. Every year, my wife and I travel to a state in the U.S. and drive through another before catching a flight back home. It's usually a seven-day trip. Last year, we decided to travel to Chicago because I grew up a huge Bulls fan. After spending two days in Chicago, we decided to drive through Iowa, then end up in Kansas City before catching a flight to Miami and then back home. We left Chicago on Route 88, then connected on 80 and drove to Des Moines. When we got to Des Moines, it was late in the afternoon, but my wife was getting cranky, so I kept on driving. We took Route 35, heading towards St. Charles, and by this time, the sun was setting. My wife was sleeping in the passenger seat, and I was going about 40 miles per hour. We came to a dense area of trees, and about 50 yards ahead of my car, a large dog-like creature standing on two legs stepped out onto the side of the road with its nose in the air as it was sniffing. I drove past this animal going about 40 miles per hour and could tell by its genitals it was male. It looked like when you hold a male dog up on two legs, but it was the height of my driver's side window, so it had to be at least seven to eight feet tall on two legs. After getting about 50 yards past the animal, I stopped the car in disbelief and just stared at this massive animal through my inside rearview mirror. When I did that, it looked at the car and made a blood-boiling growl that woke my wife. It then started to walk at a fast pace towards the car and then dropped to all fours. I was in disbelief, but the fear and panic I felt for my wife made me react, so I hit the gas again and quickly got to 30 miles per hour. This animal made another howl, and to my disbelief, two smaller creatures leapt to the road and pursued my car. At this time, my wife was screaming bloody murder. The largest creature managed to get to the car before I could accelerate fast enough and went back up onto two legs and grabbed at the trunk of the car. I swerved the car to the next lane and it let go. It fell back to all fours, stumbling. At this time, I soiled my pants out of sheer panic and horror. After getting to about 50, they seemed to give up. The large one just stood in the middle of the road while the other two caught up. I was looking in the rearview mirror at three creatures that were not supposed to exist. Then all three dropped to all fours and leapt off the road. What I saw was three animals with wolf-like faces, brownish golden fur, long muscular arms with long curved claws, pointy ears, and huge canine teeth. Its eyes looked empty and without remorse, and I honestly believe they had every intent to attack us if they caught us. When I finally decided to stop my car, I was in Kansas City. I looked at the trunk and there were claw marks on each side back panel as if the creature was hugging the back of the car in an attempt to forcefully stop the car. Needless to say, I had to pay for that damage and the cleaning of the inside because of the smell of urine. I'll never drive through the U.S. again and even on my island I still struggle to look through my rearview mirror for fear of what I'll see there. My wife had to seek counseling because every crack she heard she'd panic and she wouldn't go outside at night alone. 
We live on a small island and our lives have forever changed. If you've ever watched Van Helsing, the brown werewolf is the closest I've seen to what we saw. My wife almost went into shock when we saw that werewolf in that movie. Signed, Anonymous. Location, Madison County, Iowa. Date, July of 2016. Well, that was the last story. Thanks for sending those in. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Hondo, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Vic. Glad to be here. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Please give us a brief bio on yourself. Okay, uh, call sign is Hondo. Um, 22 years military experience, 14 of that in Special Forces. I've been attached to 7th Special Forces Group, 3rd Group, and finally 1st Special Forces Group, Operational Detachment Delta. Uh, if anybody knows exactly what that is. I uh, recently retired out, but I still am a government contractor, so that's why I would just go by my name, call sign Hondo. Government have a field day on me. <laughs> Otherwise. <laughs> oh, I bet they would. When was the first time you heard the term dogman, Hondo? I heard it right after I had my first experience. I actually got on the internet and started researching these things, and that's how I come across your site. So before you had that encounter, that first encounter, you had never heard the term dogman before? No, I mean, I've heard the term werewolf, and I figured that something might be out there, but you know, I've spent all my life in the woods and the mountains here locally and never seen anything or heard anything like that before my first experience. Yeah, after that first experience, I'm sure that opened your eyes to a lot of possibilities. You've had more than one run-in with a dog man. Do you think the reason you're here to talk about what happened to you is because of your training? Training and just by the blessing and protection of the Lord God Almighty. It's why I'm still here, sir. Yeah, I'll bet you're right. I'll bet both of them played a big hand in that. The encounters we're going to talk about tonight happen near a section of the Appalachian Trail. What can you tell us about that section of the trail and dairy around where this happened? Well, we have a place called Shady Valley. This is in northeast Tennessee, uh, almost at the very tip. It's flat land there in the valley, but it's up in the mountains. It's about eight miles away from a place called Mountain City. It's actually where my father lives now. You know, you're surrounded by high country mountains, but there's a nice flat valley. It kind of plateaus there, which is perfect for farmland. It does sound like a pretty area. How long have you lived in that area near the Appalachian Trail? Well, for the exception of 22 years in the military, all my life. Okay, so you know that area like the back of your hand then. Yes, sir. Now that you had those encounters with dogmen, how has that changed the amount of time you spend out there in the woods around you? It's changed dramatically. I used to go up in the woods a lot. I'm talking every other day up in the mountains. Now, not as much. If I do go, I do go armed. These experiences really opened my eyes to what I was out there. And not everything out there is nice. Yeah, unfortunately they're not. Do you have any concerns about being followed home by one of the dogmen you've been looking for? I do, sir. I can't prove it, but I think that I was finally tracked down, at least uh, the area that I live in. Uh, some things have been going on that I actually can't explain. Uh, I know it's not a bear, and I know for a fact it's not a wolf or a coyote. So, I haven't seen anything, and I've just heard a lot of weird sounds and just feel like I'm being watched, and that sixth sense kind of kicks in. Well, I hope you're wrong on that. I hope it's not a dogman that followed you home. If you knew for sure a dogman had followed you home, would you pack up and move, or would you stick it out? I would stick it out, but I would definitely do certain things to make sure that my animals were safe. You know, I've got dogs. I absolutely love my dogs and my cats. You know, they're like my kids. and. I'll do whatever it takes to protect them. Well, I hope it never comes to that, but if it does, I can't think of anyone better prepared to handle something like that. September last year, you had an encounter with something you never knew existed. Please tell us about it. Yes, sir. It was a September, I believe it was the 17th. It was on a Saturday. 
beautiful day. I woke up and I wasn't feeling too good. I've been suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder here. Kind of got a little worse. Things just started closing in. You know, I'm just going to go up to the mountains, just go hiking. It's a place right off the Appalachian Trail called the Nick Patch. All it is, it's just a little flat place right there and you're surrounded by mountains it's got a little rocky outcrop and i decided to just hike up there you know it's five six miles right off of highway 91 there i grabbed my plate carrier which is uh if anybody's ever been in the military you know what those are you know you've got your magazine holsters and stuff like that the only thing i took was a knife i tried to stay in shape and believe you that plate carrier that thing weighs quite a bit so I just decided, you know, just to get up and get away. I knew I was going to be up there overnight. So, you know, I took some matches and a couple of MREs and just started hiking. I mean, it was beautiful. Like I said, there really wasn't a cloud in the sky. I would say it was around 70 to 75 degrees. It was, you know, just a beautiful day to be up in the mountains. So I was hiking about... Oh, I don't know, three or four hours, and I passed some hikers coming in. Matter of fact, two sets. There was two females and a male, the last hikers I saw coming out, and it was starting to get pretty dark. So I decided to go ahead and set up camp for the night. So, you know, I'd build a little fire and MRE and was just kind of chilling. Birds are singing, you know, squirrels getting ready to bed down. If there's any hunters out there, you, you know how they act, you know, right before they get up in their nest and bed down. It wasn't, oh, I don't know, maybe an hour, hour and a half after I ate that just all of a sudden everything just got real quiet. It could have been my imagination, but I swear the wind stopped blowing. And I heard a couple of twigs break, and I was like, okay, you know, it could be some deadfall falling off some of the hickory trees that was around me. But then I heard a real heavy snap. And so I immediately put my back to the fire to try to get my night vision back, kind of get my eyes settled back on the darkness. And I'd say it wasn't two or three minutes after that, this thing just, the smell is what really hit me at first. It had a strong smell of cedar, and I knew there wasn't really too many cedar trees around where I was at. So immediately that kicked in that, you know, something's not right. But then just the, the smell of wet dog really hit strong. And then just literally out of nowhere, this thing came at me. It, the first time it came, it stopped as soon as I drew my knife. I looked down and it, I swear I believe it knew exactly what a knife was. I rolled up on the balls of my feet to get a good stance to where I could move, you know, kind of like a linebacker does. It's the first thing they teach us in special forces when it comes to knife fighting. I thought it was a bear at first, but when it stood up, I knew something wasn't right. It didn't have the back legs of a bear. And when I got a real good look at the head, I, I tell you, almost passed out. It, it really it scared the hell out of me. This thing had a head like a wolf, the hind legs of a dog. Then it's when I started noticing the hands. They had like raccoon hands with, I would say, one and a half to two inch claws, maybe. But as soon as I drew my bolo knife, which is this little Filipino style fighting knife, it backed up on two legs and stayed in the shadows and it just let out a growl that felt like it was going through my soul. I've never heard anything like that before in my life. And I really... I just felt like I was surrounded by pure evil. It scared me bad. Uh, I'm not one to get, you know, easily frightened. I mean, every operation I was on, I was always scared, but never on the verge of losing control like I was here. I mean, it was an extremely scary situation, and it was definitely life-threatening. I believe this thing come out to kill me. There's not a doubt in my mind. But the way the intelligence of this thing, which is absolutely off the charts, it would use noise and light discipline. How it would try to come in and outflank me. I would be looking in one direction, and you really couldn't hear it until it come out 
and charged me again. I mean, this thing charged me on and off through the night. Uh, it really terrifying. I mean, you know, I, I'm starting to get chills thinking about it now, uh, especially just having a knife. I would have felt a little better if I had a handgun with me, but not a lot. I mean, this thing really took a lot out of me. It's really that frightening because I've never seen anything like this before. But after a few times of it charging, it knew that I wasn't going to be too easy of prey, I don't think. It's kind of why it hung back in the thicket and used kind of some huge rock formations that's up there, you know, natural rock formations. You'd see it every now and then, get on top of that, sit there and look. And it did this, I want to say, for at least a couple hours. It would move in, it would move to the side, and then try to come at me again. Now, the closest it got, I'm wanting to say maybe 15 to 20 meters, which is way too close for me. Like I said, you know, I've never experienced anything like this. I've never heard of anything like this. You know, I've watched, used to watch werewolf movies as a kid, but I always thought it was just a bunch of bunk. You know, I've never really believed in anything like that before. So it's definitely an eye-opening experience. I went through this for at least three or four hours. It didn't charge constantly. It would sit back and wait for 15 or 20 minutes or longer to see if I would kind of lax in my posture. That way it could get in and take advantage of me either falling asleep or just kind of getting in that trance mode where you're just so physically and mentally wore out. And I believe that's what it was trying to do, which tells me that these things are highly intelligent and an alpha predator. Just, I mean, there's nothing like it anywhere in the woods around here that I know of. Extremely, extremely dangerous. Finally, I want to say it is around. I didn't have a watch on me, big, so I'm sorry. I can't really tell you that time. It had to have been well over. Five o'clock when the sun finally started to come up the first lights of day. And that's, I think that's when it kind of just, I didn't know it had left until it started getting light. And I knew, you know, that it wasn't anywhere close. And that's why I started egress in the area just to get out of there. And, you know, I made sure the fire was out so it wouldn't catch the mountains on fire and then egressed out of that area. And, those were the longest five miles I've ever walked in my life. Because, you know, it was still a little dark to where, you know, there were still shadows, especially in those thickets. And I was just waiting for this thing to come out on me and wind up being a 411 case. So, by the grace of God, I finally got out of there and came back home. Well, thank goodness you made it home. It's pretty hard getting used to a world where dogmen exist versus the world you knew before your first encounter where they didn't, isn't it? It is. It's opened up a whole new world before my eyes, a world that I had no idea was there. Yeah, whoever thought they could be real, but they are. Did you ever get the impression other dogmen might have been in the area while that dogman was tormenting you? In the back of my mind, I thought maybe, but... Then I started thinking, well, you know, if there were, then they would use different tactics if there was more than one. So I'm thinking there was only one that time, thank God, because I would have been through. I mean, you know, I I wouldn't be here today talking if there was two up there at this time. I'm used to fighting terrorist al-Qaeda Taliban. This is something totally new to me and <laughs> far more dangerous in my opinion. If you have one dogman that's got it in its mind to kill you, that's bad enough, but I can't imagine what it would be like to face more than one alone that's got that on their minds. That wouldn't be good. You said you used a knife to protect yourself from the dogman that night. Before that experience, did you frequently go camping without a firearm? Yes, sir, I did, uh, especially when I was a little boy. You know, it depended on what type of the year it was, whether it was spring or summer. You know, I really didn't take a firearm with me. When it started getting into late fall, winter, I'd always take a 243 or at least a pistol with me whenever I went. Yeah, that's a good idea. You never know what you might run into. 
Now that you know they're out there, what kind of changes have you made when you're out in the bush? I've always been hyper vigilant, especially due to my tours in combat in Afghanistan and Iraq. But I've become more vigilant in the sense that I'm always, I never walk downwind. I always keep my nose to the wind. I'm always checking my six and my flanks every few steps. I'll walk 10 or 15 feet, then I'll stop, look, and listen. And I think everybody should start doing that. Be aware of your surroundings. doesn't matter if you're worried about a dog man or anything else. I mean, hey, if you don't do that, you can wind up stepping on a snake, which I'd rather step on a snake than run into a dog man any day of the week. When you say you're convinced the dog man wanted to kill you that night, I believe you, but why do you think that's what it wanted to do versus just torment you? Well, it, it was just more of a gut feeling. And uh, if there's any combat vets out there listening, you know what I'm talking about. You could tell where the enemy's shooting at you, and they're not really focused on killing you. They just want to get you out of the area. Now, if they're dead set on killing you, they're going to come in, and you get that real sick to your stomach, gut feeling, and there's also the pucker factor. And if anybody out there, like I said, combat vet, they know exactly what I'm talking about, the pucker factor. It's just that mentality that this thing had, the stance that it was taking. You know, even though I had a knife, it knew what that knife was. It knew I could do damage. It was still wanting to come in. I believe this was a territorial attack. And I also really think it just simply wanted to kill me, period. There's not a doubt in my mind that this thing did want to kill me. When you say it seemed to know what a knife was, why do you say that? Well, because the first time it charged, it was coming in all fours. And I mean, it was hauling the mail. When I got on the ball to my feet and I drew my knife out, and I braced myself for impact, it stopped. I mean, it skidded to a halt and stood up on its hind legs. More agile than any animal that I've ever seen. Like a bear walks on four legs. They're not that agile on two legs. This thing, it knew exactly what that knife was because it took a real good long look at that knife, and then you can see the shift in its eyes where it looked into my face. So that tells me that it knew exactly what a knife was, and that's why I said that these things have a very big IQ. They are extremely intelligent. Yeah, as if they weren't creepy enough on their own, their intelligence, that really puts their creep factor over the top. How big did you say that dog man was? I am six foot, and I weigh 197 pounds. I'm six foot one, sorry. And this thing was a good but but half taller than I was, so I'm saying it was seven to seven and a half foot tall. It weighed at least 350 pounds, at least, because when it charged, I mean, I could feel it coming. I can't even imagine what that must have been like. When it was down on all fours, how tall would you say it was then? I would say... On all four, it was about the size of a full-grown black bear, which I'm guessing, if I stand up, I'm guessing it would come up to about my waist or a little bit taller. It, it was a good-sized animal on all fours. So when it stood up on its hind legs, now I didn't hear any popping like its joints were popping out of place or anything. But it was just one smooth motion, and then when it stood up bipedally, I knew then that it wasn't a bear. The bear doesn't have a wolf's head, but I knew then that I was in serious trouble, and I, I just couldn't wrap my mind around what I was looking at. Because of the campfire light, could you tell what color it was? It was a dark black. It had little striations of gray or silver in it, but not a whole lot. It was mostly black from what I saw. Yeah, that's pretty typical. Most of them are black. Did you notice if it had a tail or not? It did have a tail, sir. More like a wolf's tail. It wasn't extremely long. You know, proportion-wise, I would say it's just about right the size of this thing and the tail. The next chance you get, Hondo, I want you to go on to Dogman Encounters Radio's homepage 
take a look at that dog man that's on that page and tell me how its tail compares to the one you saw. That I will, sir. I'll make sure I do that. You told me that the dog man's growl had a very unique sound to it. How would you describe it? Ah, uh, the best way I could describe it, as from what I've heard, is between a cougar growl and scream and then just a very large wolf. The way it snarled, it curled its gums back, and you could actually see the teeth. Now, this thing had three rolls of fangs on top and two at the bottom from what I could see. And just the sound of it was so great that it felt like it shook my body. Now, that might have been, you know, adrenaline kicking in and that hypervigilance portraying it to be louder than what it was, but you could hear it all through the valley, it seemed like. I mean, it was very loud, had a lot of bass to it, a lot of bass to it. Almost kind of like a howler monkey. You know, if your guests could get on the Discovery Channel or on the websites and listen to a howler monkey, almost like that, but a heck of a lot louder and with a howl in it. Yeah, howler monkeys, that is about the creepiest sound you'll hear, out in the wild at least. Especially if you're out in the jungle and you hear that at the dead of night and they shake the trees, I mean, it will scare the living out of you. Yeah, I can understand that. Did you notice any strong smells besides that strong scent of cedar when that dog man approached you? I did. Once it got into range, I could smell the coppery smell of blood when it starts forming into plasma. It's got that sweet, deathly smell to it. And wet dog. I mean, that very strong wet dog smell. It almost knocked you down. It was stout. Yeah, that'd be pretty bad. You said you saw other hikers coming up the trail you are using to get out of the area. Did you ever hear if anyone else had an encounter? No, sir. The first group was just a couple of elderly men and women. And then about an hour on into my hike, there was a guy and two girls walking down the trail giggling so it was fun telling what they was doing but everybody seemed to have been relaxed calm just having a good time so which i'd say if they run in this thing they <laughs> would have been uh calm so uh evidently you know it didn't go after them at all so i think it just waited for somebody to come up there like me who was alone you know easy prey yeah, if they would have run into that dog, man, I guarantee you the laughing would have stopped right then and there. Do you have any opinions on why no one else but you seemed to be bothered by that dog man that night? You know, I still think about it often. I was alone for one. I was totally relaxed. I mean, I get up the mountains and I feel at home. Or I used to until this happened. I've never been afraid of anything in the woods. I mean, I've walked up on bear, cougar. They've never once threatened to hurt me. I mean, they'll growl and scream and go on, but that's about it. So I really think my guard was down. I was alone. I just finished eating, and it just saw an opportunity to come on in. And it could have been a territorial thing at the same time. So I really, not for sure about that, but it, it bothers me thinking about it. I think about that often. I'll bet you do, and I don't blame you. You told me that you've hunted grizzlies before. How did that experience with the dog man compare to the adrenaline rush when you're hunting grizzlies? Well, I tell you, a grizzly, it, it's more of tracking and waiting. Now, there's a big difference, mind you, between a grizzly and a dog, man, really a grizzly's not wanting to kill you. He's just wanting to either get away from you or run you off from his territory. He, you know, he doesn't like being around human beings, and I really don't blame him. Now, a grizzly will charge you, but they'll usually stop. Unless they are just really, really hungry or wounded, they'll stop, and they'll usually run off from you. There's been a lot of cases where grizzlies haven't, you know, and if people have given mauled by them. But from my experience, 
experiences, they're more afraid of humans than we are of them. This dog man, it's just so powerful, so agile. It's just, it's just a alpha predator. I mean, I, it's between night and day. I mean, you know, if there was a fight between a grizzly and a dog man, my money would be on a dog man. Hands down, even though the grizzly outweighs it by several hundred pounds. I don't think it'd be any competition whatsoever. So imagine being all by yourself without a firearm in the middle of the night and running into one of these things. It's just not a good situation at all. It's absolutely terrifying. I'm not a stranger to wolves. I've owned wolf hybrids all my life. As a matter of fact, it's the first year that I haven't had one. I had to put Zeb down last year. It liked to kill me. Their jaw pressure is just off the charts. His was over a thousand pounds per square inch. So you can imagine. I mean, I've watched him. I used to hunt deer a lot and I'd give him a, you know, deer bone and he would just actually snap it in half with just one bite. You know, he'd bear down and you'd just hear the bone crack. So I can imagine the jaw pressure these things have. I mean, they are the alpha predator out there. People need to watch out. They need to be educated. Oh, there's no doubt about that. You told your girlfriend about your encounter not long after you had it. What kind of response did you get when you told her about it? Well, she knows what I've been through, and she knows I'm a no-nonsense type of man. She knows what I did in the military and what I still do today. She knew right off the bat that there was something wrong with just the way I was acting, my demeanor, she told her to leave me, and I, I was really glad that she did. I mean, I knew she would, but I was, you know, in the back of my mind, I was like, she's really going to think I'm crazy by telling her this. So she took it well. I can say some of the women that I've dated in the past would not have. They just couldn't live with what I did for a living. When I was in the military, when I left, there was well over a 70% chance that I wasn't coming back home alive, the type of operations that I've done in the past. So all in all, she took it very well, considering. That's a good thing. If your feeling about the possibility of a dog man having followed you home is correct, how do you think your girlfriend would respond if she looked out the window one day or one night and saw one out there looking at her? <laughs> well, I gotta be honest with you. It would definitely get a, uh, a face full of lead. I've been teaching her how to shoot. I've been training her and the mechanics of AR-15s to sniper rifles to pistols. Yeah, it, it definitely get a loud scream from her and then a face full of lead, I'm sure. She sounds pretty tough. That's impressive. After your first encounter, you had some bad dreams. What can you tell us about them? About a week or two after my first encounter, I really started having bad dreams about me going outside and finding some of my dogs ripped up. Now, you know, again, my dogs and my cats are my babies. And I'll do whatever it takes to protect them. And it, it's just on and on. And the last dream which really put me over the edge is when I heard my dog screaming and went outside and this thing had one of my dogs in its jaw and just bit down and just ripped it in half. That really set me off, and I took that as a direct threat. So I acted on that. I don't blame you. You and a friend went back to the place where you had that first encounter. Please tell us more about that. That was due to the last dream I had, and that's what really put me over the edge. Now, there was five members of my original 12-man team. They're still left alive, and we actually all retired very close together out of the military, and we started doing contract work. They all lived close to me. We'll call him Dano, which is his call sign, Dano. Pretty big guy. He's Irish. Matter of fact, <laughs> my whole team's Irish. They call us the Mix Squad. Now, I called him, and I, you know, I told him about what had happened, and being his commander, he knew that I wasn't one to just get carried away about stuff. So, you know, he said, yeah, sure. He said, you know, you sure it wasn't a bear? I said, I'm telling you, Dano, it wasn't. So, you know, we got loaded up. We took our ARs up there. We had, we're actually allowed to carry suppressors with us. So, 
we went and got our suppressors and went back up there because, you know, if we wound up getting in a firefight, we didn't want everybody in the valley hearing it and then that attracts unwanted attention, especially by TWRA and local sheriff's department and God knows what else they would call. So he was a good sport about it. He decided, you know, he would go up there with me. And I thank God he did. We went up to the same place. I had my experience. We waited till an hour before dark, and we went up there and we got set up. Now, we set up just exactly like I had it, small fire, one man up. We had 50% up, 50% down posture as far as one kind of resting, the other one watching. When they first started coming down, it was well after 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning when we first got the sense that something was coming in. It did the same thing. I can't tell you if this was the same one. I don't know. I only thought there was one we was engaging at the time. I had no idea that there was two until later. I was down. I mean, I was, I'll be honest with you. I was getting ready to fall asleep. I mean, it was just quiet. There was some night creatures scurrying around. I mean, you know, it just didn't get quiet. That's, you know, we had no idea it was close. As you, the last time when everything got quiet is when this thing come out at me. Well, it wasn't quiet this time. You know, you can hear a owl in the distance kind of hooting and going on. So that's like a lullaby to a country boy. You hear that, you're going to go to sleep if you're a country boy. When all of a sudden, Dan O said contact rear. I mean, he actually screamed it, and that's when I felt like the whole earth was shaking. This thing came in and was growling and snarling, and Dan O just popped off a couple of rounds and hear it scream, and then it got back into the bushes. And I finally got up and, excuse my French, got my together, you know, uh, finally snapped out of my days. And I went over to where Dano was sitting, and we got back to back. Not 20 meters to our right, here come another one come in, and I don't know if it's the same one or not, because Dano would hit this thing two or three good times. And you hear it scream so it wouldn't be moving as fast and as well as this other one was. So we wound up hitting it two or three times. Now, I know for a fact that these things bleed. I know you could hurt them. Okay, because we did. We actually hit it. And I'm, I want to say, I mean, yeah, we were kind of shaking up. We at least hit this thing seven or eight times. You know, we could have got it in the arm. Or the chest did one, but you know, we wound up hitting it. The first time we hit it, the chest, it dropped. It, it didn't just automatically just get back up. It dropped and was kicking around screaming. And it's when the other one come out from our left again and we fired at it. I don't think we hit it because we have EOTech scopes, the 512s. They're not really that good past, you know, 100 meters or so, but it was closer than that. Uh, I'm going to say the area that we was in was a good 75-meter circle, you know, in any direction. It was kind of clear, and that's why we chose this. But when we turned back to engage the other one, it was gone. They took off. After we had hit them, they had taken off, but we stayed up the rest of that night. You know, you know, we didn't know. We, I, I could have swore, you know, well, we had to have killed it. Had to have killed it. You know, there's no way, you know, it just walked off and, you know, miraculously healed itself or whatever. When it started getting a little light, it's when we went up there and we saw the blood bright red with bubbles. So I had to have got a lung shot in there somehow. I mean, there, there's just no doubt about it. Any deer hunters out there, you know, when you've got a good lung shot, is when the blood's nice and bright red and it's got bubbles in it. We tracked that for a while. Uh, I want to say maybe a mile, maybe a little bit more than that. And it ended going off of a rock ledge. This was maybe 30 to 40 meters deep, but it was basically straight off. And that's where the blood trail ended. So you know, we looked down. We actually I have binoculars, we looked binoculars down the side. We couldn't see any body or anything laying down in there. So, you know, maybe we didn't kill it. I don't know. Maybe that was just some blood and saliva down there. But I know for a fact that they bleed. 
Dano, he, he was really freaked out after the whole thing. He said, I thought you was crazy at first. He said, I just thought, you know, it was a bear that come at you. But he's a believer now. He's really shaken up about it. I mean, he's had nightmares ever since this happened. So we come back out when it got lighter. There was really no way to down that cliff. We didn't have any rope with us. And it's just the way the mountains are there. We'd have to go into the next valley to go in and come back up to check down there at the bottom sea, but we could see if there was any bodies down there at all. So, you know, maybe we didn't get a good hit in, but I know we hit it. I know for a fact that they bleed. Or, hey, maybe this thing crawled off and died. But anyway, you know, we decided to get out of there. So we egressed up, and we was going back to the truck. There was a gentleman at the end of the trail, you know, there's places where you can park and walk up on up the trail right there as soon as you get into Shady Valley. You go through a place called Stony Creek where I was born and raised. There was an old man in a red and white Ford truck, one of the old 70s models. I think it might have been an Explorer. He said, well, boys, he said, what are you all doing up there? He saw how we was dressed, so it's, oh, God. And I could just imagine what this gentleman was thinking. And, you know, we told him we went up there, we was going to get rid of a problem animal that we thought was a problem animal, which wasn't a lie. We just didn't want to get in depth of what was, oh, yeah, you know, we went up there and saw a werewolf and we was trying to kill it. Well, that guy would call the loony bin on us. And I really couldn't blame him. But he said, yeah, he said, I was really worried. He said, I passed your truck up here last night. And he said, I got up this morning and decided I'd better come back down to make sure he was all right. And we asked him why. And he said, well, he said, I've been losing a lot of animals here lately, and so has a lot of other farms. And you know, I said, they just been getting out? Or he said, no, he said, I've lost five. And these are full-grown cows that he was explaining to us that there was no meat taken. That they were just ripped, I mean, literally clawed to death. He said they would get in the back of the throat, get up under the chin to make the kill, but it would claw or scratch them enough to make them bleed out when they got weak to go on in and suffocate them by getting into the neck, kind of like a panther would do. So we talked to him for several minutes, and then we explained, well, you know, maybe we're after the same thing. We're just not sure. I said, we did hit something up there. I said, I'm not sure if we killed or not. We lost it off of a rock ledge. He knew exactly what we was talking about because this man had lived there all his life, so evidently he's been up in trail a lot. And he said, yeah, you won't be able to get over through there unless you go over to the next valley and go down in. So I gave him my information. I said, well, sir, if you have any problems, please give me a call. I'll try to help you in any way I can. So we had left and uh, come back home. So that that was my second experience, and that it it's still me talking about it, thinking about it. It's still unbelievable that we actually shot this thing and it didn't die. Maybe we just really didn't get a good shot at it. Knowing that you wounded that dog man that day but didn't kill it, how concerned are you about it trying to get back at you if you go back into its area? Well, the way I look at it, Vic, it's the one that first threatened me. Then it threatened my dogs. Uh, and I, I don't know. I, I'm not saying that this thing could project in dreams or talk to you in dreams. I, I don't know. I mean, hey, I didn't think these things existed <laughs> until, what, six months ago. So, you know, I really don't know a lot about them. But to me, you know, if you're going to threaten me or make me kind of threats, I'm going to come at you. I don't care who you are or what you do. If you threaten me or my livelihood, or especially my babies, I want to come for you. And that's the whole reason I did this. And people want to think I'm crazy. Well, you know, that that's fine, too. But, you know, my dogs are my kids. And I'm not going to let anything happen to them. And maybe it's just me being hyper-vigilant, but I wanted to nip that in the butt to make sure that something didn't happen to my animals. Because I don't live that far away from where this happened. I mean, I'm within a 10-mile radius, and a wolf has a 50 to 100-mile hunting area. So it's untelling how large of an area these things operate in. 
Did you ever second guess your decision to go back to the place where you had that first encounter? I did, but, you know, another thing that really set me over the edge was there's a lot of people who goes up there and hikes. I couldn't live with myself knowing that something could happen to a little child or, you know, a mom or a dad. But that just really aided me. And that was another reason I wanted to go up there and uh, try to hunt this thing down. Uh, just go ahead and get rid of it. I mean, you know, I know they do that to nuisance animals like bears that have actually known to attack people. Well, first, human beings shouldn't be up there in a bear's area anyway. But, too, you can't have them coming down into rural areas and getting into people's houses or threatening their animals either. That's the biggest reason I did it. I can appreciate that. Did you know about the whole missing 411 topic before you started researching dogmen? I did not. I knew that there's hikers come up missing quite a bit, but once I started diving into this, trying to get all the information I can, thanks to your show and a lot of its guests, I found out a lot. There's actually been people that's been killed by these things, but the government, you know, in their infinite wisdom, Besides, well, you know, it was a pack of dogs or it was this or that or the other, which we all know is they're full of crap. I could absolutely see these things coming into somebody's house or camper and killing them without any problem at all. Can you imagine being in the house and all of a sudden one breaks in and comes after you? That'd be horrible. i tell you what, uh, I'm man enough to admit it, I would probably fill my drawers. Yeah, I know I'd have a Charmin moment, too. I think almost anyone would. That wouldn't be a good situation. Yeah, because of things I know, I'd say that's happened on more than one occasion, unfortunately. Your uncle told you about a large bear that was torn apart recently. What can you tell us about that? My uncle, this has been several weeks back, uh, had told me, now, I, I didn't mention anything to my family about this. He called me, and then the person that we knew that found it had a couple of calves come up missing. And, you know, he thought it was a bear. Well, he called my uncle, want my uncle to come down and look at this bear that he had found that was really torn up. My uncle said that this thing had four claw marks going down the side, so which tells me that whatever did this was the same thing that attacked me because they have the opposable thumb, so... You know, like a raccoon is not going to claw something with all five claws. It's going to show four, which, you know, a cougar will not do that to a bear. A cougar will not kill a bear. This bear was torn up bad. He said there was just, it had to have been very large claws and a very powerful animal to do something like this. They even thought, well, it has a large black bear that's come down from the west, which there's really no way that could happen. I mean, we've never had a grizzly around here. I mean, we've got some big black bear, but nothing this size. I mean, it was just torn to pieces, and nothing was eaten off of it. You know, there was no meat or anything taken from this bear carcass at all. It was just killed. That had to be a sight to see. You told me you'd love to have a dogman investigator go out with you and your team into the areas you've been researching to look for dogmen. What can you tell us about that? We need to know all we can about these things. You know, like the farmer that I would mentioned before, he actually called us a couple weeks later and had us come out. So I gathered my team together and we went up there that night and started tracking because he wound up missing a steer. I mean, there was a huge blood spot. Uh, he could see where the fence had been mashed down, you know, barbed wire fence. The back this thing was so strong enough that it would mash it down, you know, kind of like a human would, put his hand on the barbed wire fence and push it down and then kind of step over it. Well, this thing actually did that carrying a steer, two or three hundred pound steer from what we could see doing it. So we decided to go up there that night and see if we could track whatever this was and just, you know, go ahead and deal with it. You know, we heard a lot of strange noises. We know they was around. They just really didn't come in close because I think that they knew we had guns. We had a little more powerful gun than a AR-15 this time, and I'm, you know, not going to go into that just for security reasons, but these things are a nuisance now. 
you know, they're coming into people's properties. They're killing their cows and their livelihood. This gentleman has lost over $10,000, you know, within a couple of months. And that's a big hit from uh, blue-collar farmers around here. So we need somebody to come down that actually knows what they're doing, knows these things, and could tell us exactly how to track these things, what to look for, and, you know, to help these people out or at least make the area a little safer. Now, you know, everything's got a right to live. I'm a hunter, but at the same time, I'm a conservationist. I love animals. It breaks my heart to see an animal get hurt or suffer or get hit. I mean, I cry my eyes out when I see a dog get hit in the road or something, but the human being, it really doesn't bother me, and that's awful to say, but I guess being in combat has desynthesized me as far as humanity goes. But, yeah, I mean, if, if somebody out there that knows these things, knows how to track them, knows what to look for, or just wants to go up there and do research, my team is available. If they're not, I am myself. You know, they could get with you, and you could question them, and everything pans out. Go ahead and give my info, and they could contact me. I'd be more than happy to get them into an area and get them out. Trust me, I will get you in, and I will get you out, and there will not be a mark on you. I'm good at what I do. How big of an area would you be willing to go to to meet someone, an investigator, to go look for dog men? Just about anywhere within 150 miles of where I live. Uh, I live in East Tennessee, but right now, all the information that I've gathered so far is they're using this Appalachian Trail from what I gather, because a lot of people have either seen these things around here, you know, they really don't want to go in depth about it, they don't want to call the cops, because some of the local sheriff's departments around here will lock you up because of stuff like that. Because they think you're on drugs, which drugs is a real bad thing around here. Unfortunately, just like anywhere else is now. But, yeah, I mean, I'll go to Georgia, uh, Virginia, West Virginia, just about where, you know, if it's over 200 miles, I'll tell them this. They can pay for my expenses, and I'll be there, whether it's Montana, Colorado, wherever. But if you're within 150 miles, you don't have to pay nothing. I'll get you in and I'll get you out because I need to learn about these things. I need to learn what I'm up against, what I'm dealing with. Well, I've got some people in mind. I'm going to contact about this and see if they have an interest in taking you up on that offer. Yeah, I wouldn't send anyone your way that I didn't actually know because if I did that, who knows what you'd be getting. But yeah, I'll let you know what I turn up and that way you can take it from there outstanding because you know it'll be beneficial on both sides i'm getting educated and you know maybe i could teach them some things in tracking they don't know about tracking these things is a lot like hunting human beings and i've done that quite a bit there's a big difference between an animal and a human now sometimes an animal is a lot smarter than a human i think i mean at least they've got common sense these things the intelligence is off the chart their strength they have no weaknesses that I know of, that I've seen. Yeah, if they do have any weaknesses, they aren't easy to find. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Hondo. Do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Yes, I do. People, if you're going out in the wild, just be aware of your surroundings. Stop, look, and listen every once in a while. Keep your nose to the wind. Go with your gut. If something doesn't feel right, chances are it's not right. I didn't believe in these things before, but I do now. And, you know, my experience and my training, uh, I'm not saying I'm a bad but, hey, even us tough guys get scared, and these things scare the out of me. If you're thinking about hunting them, don't. All you're going to wind up doing is get yourself killed and the people that are going with you. Well said. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for coming on the show tonight, Hondo, and sharing those experiences with us. And more importantly, thank you so much for your service to our country. I really do appreciate it. I was proud to do it, sir, and it means a lot that you guys still think about us. It really means a lot. Thank you all. Oh, I do. Well, thanks again so much. I really appreciate it. Have a great night. You too, sir. Thanks. Bye. Bye.